When did you begin to write? When I was born, my mother asked the midwife, is it a boy or a girl? And the midwife said, neither one, it's a writer. <laughs> I would like to know what you feel when you write in Yiddish and you know that your greatest audience lives no longer. When I sit in the cafeteria near the Jewish Daily Forward and my cronies begin to bother me, what will happen to Yiddish? I say to them, I have some comfort for you. And they say, what kind of comfort? And I say, we are having now about four billion people. But a hundred years from now, we will most probably have a hundred billion people, the way we multiply. And every one of these hundred billion people will need a topic for a PhD. <laughs> I was reading recently that Sholomash yes. criticized your work as not being humanistic, as not being moral, mm -hmm. as not leading toward the betterment of human society. How, do you, how would you react to that? How do I, you see your role in literature he, general? He might be right, who knows? <laughs> Thank you for a lovely evening. You are a kind, a kind gentleman. No, I, I, I mean it was very much delightful. When I write about Yiddish-speaking people, I am limited in my choice. I cannot suddenly begin to write about a man from Texas, about a, a nine millionaire in, in Texas, because this is not a man who speaks my language, neither do I know his way of thinking and his way of talking. But this limitation, in a way, has enri enriched me. I said to myself, here are my people, these are the events which I can write, and here is my, so to say, my literary gold mine. That winter was one of the coldest. Listen to something, or now listen, how will you now say? Now hear a story. Now listen to something, or oh, hear something. Now listen to this. Now listen to this, okay. This is it. Once someone told me, what would you do if you would meet the Almighty? And he would tell you, I'm ready to do you a favor. What kind of favor would you ask from him? And I would say, God Almighty, do me a favor and become a translator from the Yiddish. <laughs> I would like you to translate. I was told, it's written somewhere, that the Torah was translated into 70 languages. And most probably it was done in a miraculous way because Moses didn't have so many translators in his time. I tell you, if you would give me now all the billions in the world, I, my life would not change at all. I would still live here and, and eat the same uh, vegetarian food and scribble with this pen or with another pen. Maybe my wife, maybe Alma would have liked diamonds or something. I, I don't no, need... I have everything I need. Oh, she also is satisfied. So you keep the billions to yourself. To me it was as simple as that. I said to myself, I would like to marry her. Of course, there were complications all the time. And I don't expect everything in human life to go completely straight and simple. this room, my wife Alba always tells me, why don't you clean it up? And I say to her, if I clean up this room, it would lose its character. In other words, chaos is not really ugly. The chaos was before the world was created. Before God has said, let there be light, there was chaos. So chaos is even older than the light. And because of this, I say that this room should stay as it is. I could never paint this, this, this room because they take them all off and hang them up. Some, some of them fall down and I find them later. It's not planned. Nothing has a purpose. Well, I have here scores of, of doctorates. I don't know, not scores, but very, very many from, from many universities and here they stay. I have so many that some of them hang behind the door, you will not believe me, behind the door. This is the Nobel Prize. Can you see it? This is, I don't know how to call it, this is the diploma, so to say. This is uh, the King of Sweden. This is Isaac Singer. 
This is Kochman Street. This is where I, I, I was brought up. All my writings are about Kochman Street. I was four or maybe four and a half years old when my parents brought me from the little town of Radzumin to Warsaw and to Krachmalne Street. According to notions that people have today, Krachmalne Street was a street of slums. We didn't have bathrooms there and we didn't have all the other conveniences which people have today. But we never knew that there are such things or that there will ever be such things. In spite of the fact that Kochmann Street was a, a street of great poverty and also of the underworld, there were thousands of people there, Jewish people, it was a Jewish street. And as far as I'm concerned, this was the center of the universe. I was brought up in a home where the supernatural was really our daily life. We all believed in spirit, in angels, and in demons, and in devils. I was born almost with a, with a terrible fear of these higher powers, both a great curiosity and a great fear. And now at the time in my old age, I still have this feeling that I'm surrounded with powers of which I have no inkling really, I don't know what they are. This is the way they looked. This is the way I looked. Although I was brought up completely in religion, I was interested in women from the very beginning. So when my brother began to paint and he took me to a sculptor's atelier and I see all these naked women, these breasts and bellies, I did not feel that I was betraying God. I felt that I like to know more about them, to read about them and to write about them. And when I went to Warsaw, and my brother took me to the writer's club, I felt at home like a, like a fish in water. All my friends were there, the good writers, the bad writers, the young, the old. This is me with hair, believe it or not. I had some, I did have some hair 200 years ago. This is the first story I ever published under the name of Yitzhak Bashevis. A Yiddish newspaper believed in, in publishing stories. They still publish uh, stories. As a matter of fact, the, the forward published almost all my novels, serialized. Yeah. So we still uh, clung to the 19th century conditions where writers published their works in newspapers. I came here May the 1st, 1935. This is this. This is the house. These are the white columns. This was the entrance. Oh, my God, this, I'm sure 100% that this is the house where my brother lived, where I came the first day. It was May the 1st in 1935, where they took me from the ship right here. A day in Coney Island is a story of my life in Coney Island. Today I know exactly what I should have done that summer, my work. But then I wrote almost nothing. Who needs Yiddish in America, I asked myself. Though the editor of a Yiddish paper 
publish a sketch of mine from time to time in the Sunday edition, he told me frankly that no one gave a hoot about, about demons, dibbics, and imps of 200 years ago. At 30, At 30 a refugee, refugee from Poland, Poland had I had become an anachronism. As if that were not enough, Washington had refused to extend my tourist visa. The newspapers were predicting that Hitler would invade Poland any day. Lieberman, my lawyer, was trying to get me a permanent visa. But for that, I needed my birth certificate, a certificate of morality, a letter saying that I was employed, and other papers I could not obtain. I opened my eyes after a fitful sleep full of nightmares. My Warsaw wristwatch showed a quarter to eleven. Through the cracks in the shade, a golden light poured in. I could hear the sounds of the ocean. For a year and a half, I had been renting a furnished room in an old house in Seagate, not far from Esther, um, that's what I'll call her here, and I paid sixteen dollars a month for it. Mrs. Berger, the landlady, gave me breakfast at cost. Until they deported me to Poland, I was enjoying American comfort. I took a bath in the bathroom down the hall. At that time of the day, it wasn't occupied. And I could see a huge boat arriving from Europe, either the Queen Mary or the Normandy. It was a, a place which I loved from the very beginning because it was near the, near the ocean and at the same time far from this noise, the Coney Island noise. Many Yiddish writers lived here. Well, all, all I can say, it's, it's all gone. The writers are dead, my brother is not alive. But I recognize these columns, these, they were there. I expected Mrs. Berger's kitchen to be empty so late in the morning, but they were all there. Mr. Heikowitz, his third wife, uh, the old writer Lemkin, who used to be an anarchist, and Sylvia, who had taken me to a movie on Mermaid Avenue a few days before. When I entered the kitchen, Mrs. Berger cried out, Here's our writer. How can a man sleep so long? I've been on my feet since six this morning. Everyone teased me. Old Heikowitz said, Do you realize that you've missed the hour of morning prayer? His third wife joined in. I bet this greenhorn hasn't even got phylacteries. As for Lemkin, he said, If you ask me, he was up writing a bestseller the whole night. What are you going to eat today? Mrs. Berger asked me. Two rolls with one egg or two eggs with one roll? Whatever you give me. I'm ready to give you the moon on a plate. I'm scared of what you may write about me in your Yiddish paper. I was told that Mr. Barkan is still alive. If he is, he must be at least 100 years now or maybe older. Mr. Barkan, I recognize you. I have had many miracles happen. Is, many is. miracles happened in my life, yes. but this looks to me the, one of the great. Forty years ago, forty-two uh, years ago. Yes, no, I came here in 1935, yes. and I lived in your house in 1936. 36. It is 45 or 46 years. Oh boy. Well, I'm 102 now. 102. Yeah. Do you know that I wrote a story called A Day in Coney Island where yes. I described you? Remember how Coney Island looks? No, I don't know. I don't know. Yes, and your former wife and the borders. I was about, I was about 30 years. Then? Oh. Yes. You must have been then uh, 50 or 60. 50 or 60. <laughs> uh, but to me already, you looked old. But now I know that you were young I'm people. Old. Yes. Right, I'm old. Uh, <laughs> And all these things are here, and, and we are sitting right near one another. We remember oh, these wonderful. things. Time marches on. 
and marches in a very, in Seagate, in a very strange way. I ate my breakfast quickly and left. Outside, I looked in the letterbox, but there was nothing for me. Only two blocks away, I could see the house Esther had rented the winter before last. Uh, she let rooms to people who wanted to spend their vacations near New York. I couldn't visit her during the daytime. I used to steal over late at night. Esther was almost ten years older than I. Uh, she had divorced her husband, a Yiddish poet, a modernist, a communist, a charlatan. He took off for California and never sent a penny for their two little daughters. He was living with an artist who painted abstract pictures. A lot of Yiddish writers and journalists lived there that summer, and they were not to know about my love affair with Esther. Since I didn't intend to marry her, why jeopardize her reputation? This house was full of Yiddish writers. Here they were sitting and discussing literature, and there I came in the middle, a new writer, a, a would-be writer, a brother of a writer, and all, and, and this, this Esther was a beautiful woman, a widow. It, it, well, it's, it's one of those things which a, a man, especially a man who writes, cannot forget. been in America for 18 months, but Coney Island still surprised me. The sun poured down like fire. From the beach came a roar even louder than the ocean. I passed a sideshow displaying a creature that was half woman, half fish. A wax museum with figures of Marie Antoinette, Buffalo Bill, and John Wilkes Booth. A store where a turbaned astrologer sat in the dark, surrounded by maps and globes of the heavenly constellations. Everyone bellowed in his own way. Sellers of popcorn and hot dogs, ice cream and peanuts, cotton candy and corn on the cob. I decided to walk to Brighton. The girders of the L threw a net of sun and shade on the pavements. A train from Manhattan zoomed by with a deafening clatter. I passed by windows displaying mattresses and samples of roofing shingles, kosher chickens. I stopped at a Chinese restaurant. Should I go eat lunch? No, in the cafeteria it might be a nickel cheaper. I was down to almost my last cent. If my sketch after the divorce didn't appear in the Sunday edition, nothing remained but suicide. I knew that those who are condemned to death order last meals. People don't even want to be executed on an empty stomach. I counted my money and I remembered that I had to call the newspaper and ask about my sketch. I knew that a call from Coney Island to Manhattan cost 10 cents. And the Sunday editor, Leon Diamond, rarely came into the office. I prayed to the same powers preparing the world catastrophe that the operator wouldn't give me a wrong number. I pronounced my number as clearly as I could in my accent, and she told me to put in my dime. The girl at the switchboard answered, and I asked for Leon Diamond. 
I was almost sure she would tell me that he wasn't in his office. But I heard his voice on the line. I began to stutter and excuse myself. When I told him who I was, he said brusquely, Your story will be in on Sunday. Thank you. Thank you very much. Send me a new story. Goodbye. A miracle. A miracle of heaven. I shouted to myself. The moment I hung up, another miracle occurred. Money began to pour from the telephone. For a second, I hesitated. But the telephone company would never get it back anyway, and someone who needed it less than I might find it. It was almost a dollar, and I suddenly became rich. Is this actually a true This story? actually happened. And in addition, when I finally made a call, I learned that the story was accepted. And then they paid for a story about 50 or 60 dollars. This meant to me about three months uh, rent. A Yiddish journalist came over and sat at my table. Where have you been hiding these days? Nobody sees you. I looked toward the door and I saw Esther. She was wearing a white dress and a straw hat with a green ribbon. She was brown from the sun and her black eyes had a girlish sparkle. She didn't look like a woman approaching 40, but slim and youthful. She came over and greeted me as if I were a stranger. In the European fashion, she took my hand. How are you? I haven't seen you for a long time, she said. He's hiding, the writer denounced me. I advise him to marry an American woman because he'd get a visa that way, but he won't listen. Why not, Esther asked. I would have liked to make a clever, sharp reply. Instead, I said sheepishly, I wouldn't marry to get a visa. The writer smiled and winked. I'm not a matchmaker, but you two would make a fitting pair. I knew I had to answer right then, but not a word came out. I felt hot. I had the painful feeling that my chair was tipping over. The floor heaved up and the lights on the ceiling intertwined, elongated and foggy. The cafe began to circle like a carousel. Esther got up abruptly. I have to meet someone, she said, and turned away. I remained sitting, baffled by the sudden shift in my luck. In my consternation, I began to count and recount the coins. As my game with the powers on high stood now, I seemed to have won a dollar in some sense and to have lost refuge in America and a woman I really loved. I would say that many writers have tried to get rid of love in their stories. They have decided that we can write a novel, a romance without love. But I don't think that this has ever succeeded in literature. If there is no love, there is no real story. It is not an accident that they call in, in uh, Europe a novel, a romance, because it is a love story. The reason why literature needs so much a love story is that nowhere is the human individuality, the human character, the human personality expressed so clearly as in love. All our weaknesses come out in love and all our strength comes out in love. Some people who may be giants in finances or, in, or on the battlefield become terribly weak and almost uh, creepy in, in love. I'm already hungry, aren't you? All right, you will get something to eat. Are you aware that the garden cafeteria is uh, being sold as of right. today? Be today is being sold. It's being it's sold be today. It's going to be a Chinese today. restaurant. Today. today. Today is the last day. It's the last day. Today is the last day. Let's go in there, absolutely. Hello, hello. You cannot get rid of me. Oh my God, I hear, isn't that I, nice? I hear it's the last day. It's unbelievable. It's a real shame that they are closing it. But on the other hand, 
it cannot be a, a coincidence. I think really that from our above, some some celestial director made it, made us come here. I want to tell you that for a, an immigrant like myself, the existence of a cafeteria was to me a great riddle, because we did not have anything like this in Europe. When I came to this country, I, I went in for the first time into a cafeteria, but I didn't know what it was. I thought it was a restaurant. And I saw many people going with trays. And I said to myself, so many waiters in such a little place, how does it happen? Why do they need so many waiters? And whenever I saw one with a tray, I gave him a sign, which means I thought he's a waiter, that I want him to bring something to me. But these people all ignored me. Some of them smiled. And I said to myself, what a wicked place. It almost looks to me like a dream. A little place with so many waiters and no one pays any attention to me. It took place until I learned what a cafeteria is. It became my second home. The cafeteria has become, so to say, a home for, for the refugees from Poland and from Russia and from other places. Many of my stories take place in the cafeterias where all these people came. The normal people and the half normal and the crazy ones. So this is the background of my stories which take place in cafeterias. That all these people would die out and I will be almost one of the few last never occurred to me. The first novel which I published here was, was a, a novel about Jacob Frank, and I did not succeed. I just failed. So I was deeply ashamed. I said to myself, here I have failed. I came to America and I failed. I was ashamed to show my face. So when I wanted to deliver a copy, I used to go there 12 o'clock at night when nobody was there, and I put in my little pages into a box there in the and this is the way it lasted until I began to publish some better things. Mr. Stinger, so good to see you. Shalom Aleichem. Shalom Aleichem. This is no longer what it used to be. Uh, Nothing here is what it used to be. Don't I? This is now a Chinese I, church. I italic me, don't <laughs> I know it? Since I came to the United States, such mighty newspapers like the Herald Tribune, the Sun, the Telegram, have all folded, have all stopped existing, the Jewish Daily Forward still appears. They once asked me, what is the reason that all these mighty magazines and newspapers went bankrupt and the, and the Forward is still there? And I said, these mighty newspapers, they had very good uh, bookkeepers. And when they were bankrupt, they knew about it. Our bookkeepers are old people, half blind. They don't know what's going on. And since we don't know, we, we don't know that we are bankrupt, we keep on living. It is a joke, but there is also some strange truth in it. If you don't know really how sick you are, you may go on living another 20 years just because you don't know. These are old numbers of the forwards. Where, where, where my stories are published. Oh, here's a newspaper. It's the foreword of July 24, 1970. This is not really so old, only, only 15 years old. Let me see what, what, what is mine. Oh, here there's a story called The Briefcase, which has been published, and they're even making now a movie of it. This Renzel, this, the briefcase. I don't need it because it has already been translated. But if I want to publish it in Yiddish, I may use this. So this is one. Let me take out another one from the middle. This is, what is this? Let me see. It's Saturday, July 18. I'm afraid the briefcase is here too. I keep on getting very good letters from the readers all the time. 
older people who read the forward read also me because it's a small newspaper. So I know that at least 20,000 people are going to read me the next week. There are many more people of good taste among the readers than among the critics. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, ask me any question you feel like asking. If I know the answer, I will answer you. <laughs> and if I don't know the answer, I will answer you anyhow. <laughs> yes, please. Do you believe in life after death? Whatever it is, it must be better than what we are having today. <laughs> At least we don't read newspapers there. If there was some message that you could give to the leaders of our country right now, what would that message be? If I would know that the leaders of the world are sitting right here and they are waiting for my message, I would find a message somehow. <laughs> I don't want to tell people what kind of a message I have. I rather tell them there is no message in what I'm writing. You read the story and you create your own message. I don't have to do everything for you. Could you tell us how you feel about free will versus predestination? I absolutely believe in free will. There are fatalists who said everything is destined. Just the same, when you, when, I, when you walk with a fatalist on the street and he cross over the street and he suddenly realizes that he's crossing a red light, he, begin to, he begins to run so quickly <laughs> as if he would be a believer in free will. <laughs> in other words, when it comes to our life, we all believe in free will. We, we only try to deny it when it comes to doing some good deeds. Then you say, it's destined that this poor man should die from hunger. Why should I help him? In other words, we, we must believe in free will. We have no choice. In much of world literature, the fool is considered to be of divine origin. Can you comment on that? I would say that there is a gimple in every human being. There is also a fool in every saint. The saint really believes that what he is, he can make all of humanity like him. And this is his foolishness. But without this naivety, without this foolishness, humanity wouldn't have reached the little which it has reached until now. In this respect, I am one of these fools. How did you feel when you received the Nobel Prize? Of course, I did not expect to get the Nobel Prize, but when I came home from breakfast, I saw people were standing with cameras around my place and reporters and they all asked me the same question. Were you surprised? Were you happy? So since I did not want to ha have a discussion with them about what happiness is, <laughs> I, I said yes, I was surprised and I was happy and this went on for about 10 or 15 minutes. Then there was a pause. And for a few minutes later, another reporter came in and he said, were you surprised? <laughs> were you happy? And I said, how long can a man be surprised? <laughs> and how long can a man be happy? I have already been surprised, I have already been happy, and now I'm the same schlemiel as I was before. <laughs> Dear Mr. Singer, Maestro and Magician, it's my task and my pleasure, my very great pleasure, to convey to you the heartiest congratulations from the Swedish Academy and to ask you to receive the Nobel Prize in Literature 1978 from the hands of His Majesty the King.
der Nobelpreis Laureat in Literatur für 1978. Itschok Bashevis Singer. His Majesty, ladies and gentlemen, people are asking me often, why do you write in a dying language? And I want to explain it in a few words. Firstly, I like to write ghost stories, and nothing fits a ghost better than a dying language. The deader the language, the more alive is the ghost. Ghosts love Yiddish, they all speak it. <laughs> Secondly, I believe in resurrection. I'm sure that the Messiah will soon come and millions of Yiddish-speaking corpses will rise from their graves one day. And their first question will be, is there any new Yiddish book to read? Of course, in my age, there's more to look back than to look forward to. Still, I'm looking forward to because tomorrow I intend to sit down and write another story. The story itself may look back, but I'm looking forward to the story.